I grew up in India. The first 20 years of my life, I was in India. And hospitality in Asia is very different from hos hospitality in the Western world. They say that it is in the soul. Um, and you don't have to artificially curate it or rehearse it. So, in a way, you can say that I came here with hospitality being in my soul. Now, that doesn't mean necessarily that you'll go into the world of hotels and resorts and you can go into, you know, Indians normally. When I first came in 1972, uh, we were, <laughs> they didn't know what the hell to make of us. Uh, they, they would ask whether I'm a dot or a feather. Dot is a dot. Mm -hmm. That is an Indian from India. Feather is an Indian from the United States. There was, there was sort of, we were, um, they didn't quite know what to make of us. And this is in the 1970s? Or? This was the early, very early 70s. Okay. Yeah. It, and then, you know, the, the, the typical question was, how come you speak such good English? And, and you know, there was a time when India was a British colony and, and, and everybody speaks English. So, but yeah, whether you go into now, obviously with the tech revolution, you know, there are lots of Indians uh, in the United States. We're still pretty minor, minute minority, but um, it, it, the, the world has changed, right? Especially being in the Silicon Valley. So it doesn't matter whether you're a doctor, an engineer, or a computer scientist. There is hospitality is sort of inbred. In, in it's it's cultural. Hmm. Hey, is that something that you think it's because of a early experience, or when you say it's in your soul? Uh, how, how do you mean? Is it like the very earliest um, things that you see as a as a young child? Yeah, you yeah. You, see, you see that as a young child. You're always you, you're taught to welcome people. You're taught to be very polite. You're taught, you know, it's it, it's very different. Um, and jumping, well, we can jump around. Yeah. You know, what, like we have resorts, our existing resorts and our legacy resorts are in the United States, in um, uh, in France, in Fiji. And there is an incredible difference. In Fiji, for example, the employees don't need to be taught hospitality. It's just in them, you know, and they don't, they call you by a first name because they don't know any way else. Um, and so it's, it's different. So different parts of the world, hospitality has different connotations, right? But it's not, it's not learned yeah. in Asia and in, in places like Fiji, you know, in the South Pacific, it's just in their soul, in their hearts. With the environment you're describing in the early '70s in the Bay Area doesn't feel hospitable. It sounds oh, no, almost no, 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 it sounds no. almost hostile. No, no, not no. at all. Not uh, at all. Uh, it, it was like they, they, they wanted to get to know us. Oh, you know, it's it was okay. it's it was a very inquisitive period where everyone wanted to know everyone else. It was it was. Towards the end of the, the, the hippie movement, and um, it was a fascinating time. You've described yourself as a long-haired, hippie-meaning <laughs> individual at that time. Yeah, my, my uh, I, again, growing up in India, America was God's country. Why is that? Because it was America, you know, uh, everywhere in the world, this was... 
like the, the freedom of choice, the freedom of entrepreneurial initiatives, um, the music, the, the, you know, the think for yourself mantra. And I remember as a kid, every Saturday morning, there was Voice of America on the radio. There was no television. It was on the radio, and and we would all be glued to the radio, you know, and uh, th that it was the Beatles, and it was uh, Richie Havens, and and on and on and on. And so, as you can see right there, that's the Beatles. That's the last. That one is the last Beatles perf uh, concert ever at Candlestick Park. Yeah, 1966. Yep, August 29, 1966. Right, and uh, so, and uh, th th there was magic in the air, um, and so I very early in my life I decided I'm, I I want to go to the to the United States, and so when I got here, you know, people just embraced us. I loved it. So you've said that within one week of being here, you decided this is home. Yeah. This is home. I'm very curious about how places shape people. And um, you talked about your uh, impressions of America. Moving here, you move here. I'm curious maybe specifically about the San Francisco Bay Area. How has this place shaped you into the person you are today? I, I think... Northern California had, had had a certain magic about it. Um, it wasn't as artificial as the Midwest. It wasn't as, at that time, as edgy as the East Coast. Um, there was just enormous freedoms all over the place. Um, you know, the, you can say whatever you want about the hippie movement, and, but and that was fascinating. And we needed that kind of a movement was very, very necessary. And not everybody will agree with me, but I think it was very necessary. How did it change culture? It changed me from being a pretty straight-laced, uh, conservative, uh, you know, in in thought, in dress, and in every way to sort of blending in with, in the environment that we were in. You know, there were the, the people's park, there were all the, 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 it was just not always riots. It was speeches and music and, you know, it, it, um, it was a wonderful time, and I was so happy and so fortunate to be a part of that. So sitting here now, you have created the best resorts in the world. Is there any part of you that was shaped back then? You think that stayed with you? Nah. I, I, first of all, I did not create the best resorts in the world. I, ha I have been very, very fortunate uh, in my life to be surrounded by people that are a hell of a lot smarter than I am. And uh, they were the ones that did it. I simply happened to be there and my entrepreneurial instinct put the steam together uh, to create these wonderful resorts. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm very proud of that. Very, very proud of that. But, you know, Nobody does it on their own. There are so many, many people that have contributed to my success. You talked about an entrepreneurial instinct. You, early on, created a very successful restaurant. Uh, I wonder, so the restaurant and the hotel and resort business obviously are in the bigger family of hospitality. Sure, absolutely. But was there it, things that you learned in that process of running the restaurant that informed your later work in the lodging side of hospitality? People interacting with people you know you learn you learn so much more from failures really than from successes and so the, the restaurant business was a combination of the two i was immature 
but a buddy of mine and I from Berkeley, we didn't know what the hell to do after we were done with our studies and 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 I didn't want to sell my soul to the devil and go into the the IBMs and the Bank of Americas of this world. You know it. I Why just, is that? What would you think? I of? don't know. I just it, maybe it was a maybe it was mild indoctrination in the Berkeley atmosphere. But um, we decided, what the hell? Let's let's open a restaurant. Uh, you know, we drove across the bridge to Marin, and we all went like, "Whoa, Marin! This is where all the rich folks live, and this is so not us." And but we found Marin was more like a like a wealthier Berkeley. Um, and so anyway, we found this place and we signed stupid that we were, uh, we were so dumb. We, we signed a lease. Then we found out that there was a moratorium on restaurants in Sausalito. <laughs> he said, oh shit, now what do we do? So we went, there was a very famous mayor in Sausalito. Her name was Sally Stanford, and Sally was a madam. She ran brothel, uh, brothels in, in San Francisco before that, and then she became the mayor of Sausalito. And I went to Sally and I said, "Sally, what do I do? I, you know, I'm just a new kid. I just, we just graduated, and and she said, "Stop whining. Be a man." <laughs> I said, but I'm going to fight against you because you're the mayor. You're so she said, fight. And she navigated sort of uh, the, the whole concept of the restaurant. And therefore, we, and we opened a restaurant. So I got a whole bunch of people from Berkeley in those painted vans with peace signs and, and Rastafarian hair and all these dudes that came over. And they did all the, the carpentry and all that stuff. And, and we were just so, we had no clue what we were doing. Then we suddenly didn't have a chef. We were going to open an Indian restaurant. We didn't have a chef. So I called my mom and dad and I said, I want a chef. So they sent their chef. So, so our family chef came from India to cook at the restaurant. And we created, we were just fumbling along and it became so successful. It was on KGO radio and, um, yeah, you know, we were sort of not that far from that famous uh, recording studio in Sausalito. So we had a lot of celebrities coming in there and the guys, from the, you know, from the Grateful Dead, uh, Van Morrison was a regular, Julie Christie. So it was lots of fun doing that. But I was still pretty irresponsible about stuff, you know, and then I got married and I said, uh oh, now I need to get a real job. So we sold the restaurant and we so we sold the restaurant and these 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 Chinese folks came with a suitcase full of cash. And that was it. That was, that was my foray into the restaurant business. I love the restaurant story. But when you think about luxury, your, the properties that you built and helped help create um, are uh, the best in the world. And so I'm curious, when, when you think about luxury, is what is special or, or, or why does luxury matter for lack of a better term? I'm, I'm curious, is it the pursuit of excellence? What attracts you to luxury beyond it just feels nice and it looks beautiful? Yeah, I just morphed into it. In, in a, uh, I back, sort of almost like backed into it. And and since, I, you know, I'm sort of kind of yesterday's news. Like the, the, the young guys have come up in this in this business and they're, they're conquering the world now. But in the old days, um, in the 90s, uh, 80s, 80s, 90s, uh, you know, Western hotels, as an example, was considered a, a real luxury 
product. The Regent was several notches above a Four Seasons. And since I became involved in the Westons and the Regents from, from, a, um, from a renovation standpoint, that's where I worked first, uh, I was fascinated at the level of service. And then, you know, the industry changed as well. And um, for the very first time, you know, Regent Hotels was owned by three gentlemen, uh, Bob Burns, George Raphael, and Adrian Zecca. So when they sold Regent to the Japanese and the Four Seasons folks, um, Adrian Zecca started small ultra-luxury resorts for the first time. Now, that was genius. Um, and it was almost like I'm going to build very, very few rooms and create high demand and very high prices with high touch. So if a normal uh, hotel had a, like, maybe one staff to five guests. An Aman resort had five staff to one guest. And the staff is almost invisible. So the industry changed. Now, of course, there are lots of copycats. <laughs> <laughs> what is, um, what is luxury... What does good luxury or good service feel like to you now? Because you mentioned there's been changes in the industry. When you're a guest elsewhere, what, what, what do you appreciate most in this area? Okay. When you, when you talk about luxury, I would say 60% of luxury is service. And the rest is the bricks and mortar and the great architecture. You know, uh, think of it as, a, as sort of a funnel and you drop in a great location, a great brand, great operation, great architecture. And what comes out at the end of the funnel is close to a perfect product. Without great service, luxury is me. No, luxury just is meaningless. So it's all about service. You've described great service as being invisible, but mm -hmm. also coming with soul. What else comes to mind in terms of how you describe great service and, and the service you want? I guess the teams at these properties to be providing anticipation. You know, you. The staff needs to know what somebody wants without that person having to ask for it. Recognition. When they... But that's a double-edged sword, right? So, staff is always taught to be very careful before they say, Mr. Smith, welcome back again. Because Mr. Smith may be with his wife and the last time he came was without his wife and yep. somebody else. So, so you've got a, a, that recognition. Actually, um, I think it was at Amangani in Jackson Hole where they would have a big board of photographs of repeat guests. So the staff would know, you know, who they are. How do they get these photographs? Uh, Online, Google, yeah, yeah, investing, yeah. I think that's that's not a bad idea, actually. You know, I, I it's it's because you're small, you're such a, you have forty keys, forty rooms, you can afford to do all of that. So it's high touch, high touch, high touch. If someone is coming back to a property, there's uh, an ability to save preferences and things things like this. I'm curious if someone doesn't have an online presence and someone's arriving for the first time. Um, 
what does a good pre-rival experience look like in terms of gathering preferences and things like that? Right. So, so when they make when they make a reservation, for example, if they're driving there or if they're going to a resort for the first time and they make a reservation, the the reservation agents at the resort will ask them what their preferences are. Do they like a spa? Do they like adventure? You know, and they will curate even before these people arrive. They will have already curated something special. Now, if they come there and say, you know, don't bother me. I just want to chill. That's okay too. You know, it's like whatever you want, we will try. A very, very famous soccer player. I'm not going to name names, okay? For the, uh, a very famous so soccer player and his very famous wife wanted Thanksgiving dinner at four o'clock in the morning. Not easy to pull that off. They did it. Wow. See, I, I love that example, though, because I've heard hospitality is, the best hospitality is done for someone, not to someone. And so it's not thinking Perfectly in advance. Said. Yeah. It's not thinking in advance. You, you have to be attentive. You have to listen. Absolutely. Mm. Absolutely. Knowing what you know now, what would you go back and tell your younger self if you could teleport back into the, or into the, into the past? Well, it's funny you ask that. I have two sons. They're both in the hotel business. Right. Um, and I think the environment has changed. The overall environment, the corporate environment has changed dramatically over the years. Okay, just not in hospitality. So my advice to them has always been, start early. Don't be irresponsible like I was. You know, don't be a bum, right? Start early in the industry so that by the time you are in your late 30s, early 40s, you have reached a certain pinnacle of achievement, not just financial, but your social marriage, all that stuff. And, and that's what my wife and I sort of income, you know, to, to talk to our kids about that start early and establish yourself. Uh, I, I was just a, you know, I was a bum. I, I, I did, I was never, uh, I never took myself very seriously. And Do you think that's a bad thing? It's not a bad thing. It it may not be the right thing, but it's not a bad thing, right? Because every, from every experience, you learn something. And so when you learn something, uh, it's it's you also try to impart that experience to your kids or to somebody that you're mentoring. For example, there are a lot of kids at Cornell, um, NYU or Hong Kong the University that, that I talk to all the time and I tell them they, they want to know about my career and how do we, they get into the hospitality business and, and stuff like that. And you ask them, what's the criteria? What do you want to do? You know, because look at our business now operations, which is really the core of hospitality, is so much lower paid than finance that, and I'm not trying to be grumpy and crotchety about this. All, all I'm saying is our business has transitioned from operationally centric to financially centric. So then people like me, we had to pivot, right? How do you balance passion with profit? And that's tricky. When, when we started this company 20 years ago, Can the Canyon Group, 
I would say 90% of the people that I came across said, Homie, you're a friggin' idiot. You are going to blow your investors' money. You're going to blow your money. And because small ultra, ultra luxury resorts do not make money. Well, damn, we proved them all wrong. We proved them completely wrong. And a lot of the credit goes to, you know, the, the staff around me, the people that I accumulated, many of them I have known for years. If, if you look around here, you'll see guys that I have worked with, uh, some of them going back to the 80s. And some of them just recently, you know, in the last 15 years. I mean, you, you met Carrie. Uh, when we started this company, we didn't even have an office, and and I had to interview Carrie, and and she said I don't have a babysitter, and her little girl was just a tiny little girl, so she sat on my lap in the coffee shop while we interviewed, while I interviewed her, and I have, a, a, I hate firing people, that's a weakness. The reason I hate firing people is then I, I have failed. So when I'm pissed off at somebody, I, I always go, I'm not going to fire you, but I'm going to take you kicking, screaming to the finish line so you can get with the program. Not everybody endorses that philosophy, but that's what I have done. I hate rules. We have no rules in this company. We have no vacation. We have no sick leave. Um, people can come. People can go as long as they can, you know, do their job. While I was the CEO of the company, I said, I have, there are no rules. Just be responsible. Adults are responsible. Do you so think why? higher performers function best in that environment? I think so, but then you're a small company, right? So you can get away with all this stuff, but it, a larger organization, it's hard. It's hard. Others have described you as a contrarian. Your track record yeah. demonstrates a lot of contrarian thinking. Yeah. You mentioned the industry moving from being operations centric mm -hmm. to financially driven. Mm -hmm. Do you feel there's an opportunity for contrarian thinking now in that regard? Is there a world where hospitality prov providers, investors could operate with an operations first mindset and succeed today in a world where everyone is financially driven? Uh, yes, absolutely. And we have done it, right? So like I said earlier, you know, it's a perfect blend of passion and profit. Um, when you look so take, uh, there are only a handful of ultra-luxury brands in the world, right? There's Aman, Six Senses, Cheval Blanc, um, Ro Rosewood Baby, you know? And then there are the luxury product, that's the ritz Carlton's, the Four Seasons, yada, 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 Montage, all that. The small ultra luxury segment, I believe, has effectively transitioned from operationally centric, where a 4% return was fantastic in the 80s, to a passion and profit centric, where now, you know, a 15, 18, 22% IRR is the expectation. Also, in the last 20 years, 25 years, there is this concept of the residential product. So you build 40 keys and you build 20 villas and you sell them at exorbitant prices. So the IRR kind of jumps. But you still maintain a strong operational base. 
The operational piece is fascinating to me because you've talked about also the dynamic of the rise of influence and people sharing and word getting out and word spreading, creating demand. Mm -hmm. You also said that's not enough, right? You can have a lot of demand. It needs to trickle down through smart operations to make that kind of profit. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, very, very true. You know, again, there are people, there are lots of people in my life that have influenced me, that I've learned from. Um, and the old school folks think that when they mentor kids, they say learn operations first, then learn asset management, and then morph into finance if you want. But we are a dying breed. Um, we are the generalists. So many of us know operations, no finance, no social media, no marketing, no sales, you know, no accounting. This is a dying breed. The world of investment banking has created specialists. Um, and therefore, the the hospitality world has changed. And I wouldn't go so far to say it's driven by investment banks now, but there is a much heavier influence on that. Um, so educating even the big boys was very important. Um, you know, when we first started this, we built uh, let's say Aban Giri or uh, Four Seasons Rancho at Cantado, and we went to somebody like a KSL Partners, you know, f friends, good friends from the long, long time. And we said, take a look at what we are doing here, and we want you to finance us. And they would go, Are you kidding me? That is. Four million a key? And we say, yeah, but don't look at the price per key. Look at the NOI or look at the EBITDA. So there is a psychology, the, the, the psychology of financing and the psychology of finance for a ultra luxury is very, very different from a big box. And once they did it, then they did it over and over and over again. Another great company that, that does this is, you know, Blackstone does it, but MSD, you know, that's Michael Dell's company. Um, they have become like the poster child for luxury and ultra luxury equity and debt. So they're now, there's much more acceptability of our template in the marketplace. So I have a few follow-up questions on that. I guess I'm going to start at the highest level. Um, you've, you've said hospitality is the, the biggest, brightest, best industry in the world. I'm curious if you, if you still feel that way, and if so, why? Yeah, because it's tourism. Tourism and hospitality is the by far the biggest and most powerful industry Globally, right? You know, <laughs> years ago, when when Obama became president of the United States, he 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 tried to sort of put a slant, put a slightly leftist slant on our industry, on luxury, basically, when he said, you know. Las Vegas is bad, Four Seasons is bad, Rolex is bad, yada, yada, yada. And, and Barney's in New York were um, was embarrassed to even start putting their brand on the bags and it would be plain white bags and stuff like that. Well, what he didn't realize was that by making those kinds of statements, he was harming the very folks that voted for him. 
because it's such a people intense industry. I mean, then, you know, later on he became a big ally of tourism and hospitality. Hmm. But, but, you know, this is, it is such a powerful, powerful industry. And when you talk about the power of it from a tourism perspective, it's all the people that want to travel, have to travel. And then there's the, the element where there, it just takes so many people to provide a hospitality experience. So there's it's so a much, village. it takes a village. And so there's so yeah. many, uh, so much money moving around that because there's so many people involved. Is that, that fair? fair? So let's say for people listening, let's say, of course, everyone has a different set of interests and maybe a direction they want to go. But let's say someone's just interested in hospitality. Let's say they're working in another industry. They heard what you just said. Mm-hmm. Hospitality has so much potential. What is your advice today to people who want to build a career in hospitality in general? Where would you be focusing on? Where would you start? Well, it depends on on the age group, right? If, if a kid out of NYU, Cordell, you know, wants or, or it's, uh, Michigan State, uh, you know, these hos- hospitality schools, if they want to start, then you always, my advice to them really is, is learn every aspect. When you're young, learn every aspect of hospitality. So you, you never, you never look dumb. So start with, uh, you know, start with operations, go into asset management, and then you can decide whether you want to go into management and work for, you know, a s- small company like Amman or a big company like Starwood or Hilton or Marriott. But be a generalist first when you're very, very young. I wonder if I could just ask a follow-up to that to break it down. If you start in operations, is it frontline operations at a property? And if so, what department do you learn the most? Is it front desk? Front desk, yeah. Uh, uh, front desk, housekeeping, maintenance. Um, doesn't matter. Interesting. Yeah. And then you go from there. You you, it, 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 you understand from the fundamental level where to what it, hospitality looks like because guest interaction, right? Mm-hmm. Whether you're whether you're in a Fairfield by Marriott, which is a phenomenal, uh, or a, you know, a Hyatt place, uh, another phenomenal brand, um, or whether you're at Amman, it doesn't matter. You still are interacting with the guests. And does that make you a better brand executive or investor or asset manager later on? Yeah, it it, it creates ownership. And so. Now then, and then what happens um, is, I, is sometimes somebody that is reasonably wealthy or somebody that's uber wealthy will come out of the blue and say, homie, um, we really want to get into the hospitality business. And that's a different story, you know. Uh, wealthy people, managing wealthy people is a full-time job. And then, then because by being wealthy, they feel like they know, they know it all. Uh, and, and then you have to manage that process, you know, because they're writing the big checks. Um, my, my investors, when I first started Canyon, um, I, I had three phenomenal investors uh, from Europe, and but none of them had ever been in the hotel business. Today, all three of them know much more about hotels than I do. <laughs> I like if we could for you to, to break that down in a bit more detail because people say hospitality is driven by relationships. But what stands out to me about your life's work and people that have known you and observed you and done business with you is, um, and you've actually said this yourself before, you, it's driven by friendship. Mm-hmm. And so you can, um, I think the classic model in investment banking or investing would be, I'll give you good returns and you may not like me, but I got the returns for you. Yeah. You've said it's so important to build friendship. I guess I would love to hear you 
describe why that is, but also practically, how do you build friendship with people you do business with? What, what does that look like for Homie? Different people have different ways of creating friendships, right? I, I, you know, people always tell me that you have a golden Rolodex. Now, I had a boss when I was an investment banker who was uber brilliant. Uh, he was the head of real estate at Bank of America Securities. I mean, very circumspect, would never say a wrong thing, completely different from me where I would shoot from the hip. And, but he always said that it's good to have these friendships and relationships, but at the end of the day, do a good job. And then if you don't, if you don't go back and talk to them every three months, the next time they want something, they'll come back to you because you did a good job. I don't necessarily endorse that view because a lot of the people that I knew in the 80s, I still keep in touch with. Unfortunately, some of them are dead, <laughs> but I still keep in touch with. To me, that's very creating relationships are very important. And so, you know, there are folks that will tease me about the golden Rolodex. I, I, I just, and, and if you have an R shucks kind of an attitude, like I'll treat, you know, Joe Blows who's waiting for a bus on the sidewalk and a Saudi royalty the same. And I get away with shit that you wouldn't believe, but but I do I do get away with it, you know. And I'll I will shoot from the hip, and I I love it. You talked about friendship being everyone has a, a different perspective. I imagine that's the people you're friends with, but also the way that you are a friend to others. But I wonder if you could um, if you had to generalize, how would you describe your approach to building friendships with these people? Or it sounds like, I, I shouldn't say these people, I should say like, it sounds like you do this across the board. So like, how do you think about friendship and building friendship? I, okay, so the, the, so friendship, that, that's a pretty broad term, right? There, there are acquaintances, there are relationships, and there are friendships. I have very few friends, but I have a ton of relationships and a ton of acquaintances. And the first time I'll meet somebody, within five minutes you know whether it's going to be an, this person is going to be an acquaintance, whether it's going to be a relationship, or whether it's going to be a friendship. Um, here's an example, I'll throw out a name. Peter Uroff. Peter, Peter Uroff is an iconic man in the United States. He, you know, uh, he was a lawyer, but, but then he was the baseball commissioner. Uh, Pete was, um, he ran for the governor of California. Uh, and ultimately, he and Clint Eastwood and Arnie, uh, Arnold Palmer acquired Pebble Beach. And we... we, we our invest the bank that I worked with did that transaction. Uh, I still keep in touch with him, and I'm so enamored by a guy like that that it's almost like he's a mentor, and he's in, well into his eighties. But whenever I get a chance, I go and see him because I learn something different from him every time. He's an amazing guy. He is the only man ever to have to have run an Olympic game at a profit, right? So, and this is one of many, many examples of folks that I have relationships with. It's interesting to hear you describe that because, um, if I understand correctly, early on in your career, yeah, there were people that 
you worked with. Um, and I think you know, mentioned your first boss in the hotel business, Jim, who taught you kind of about execution. Yeah. It seemed, my impression is early in your career, you were doing the work. You were, you were, and that's one of the ways that you became mentored. But I'm also hearing from you a strong relationship base. I guess my, um, my question for you is, what? How do you think about mentorship today to others? You mentioned, you know, speaking at these different things. How do you like to mentor others at this moment in time? Is it more? I, is it more project based, or like, is it something else? No, general. It's 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 more general. Hmm. Uh, now. You project-based mentoring is is really if there's an employee here, mm-hmm. right? That that's different. Then we we are a lot of sort of gray hairs in this company and no hairs, right? Um, so we uh, project-based mentoring really is when we bring somebody on or a consultant on a long-term project. But mentoring generally is, is, you know, from 50,000 feet, you say. Here's what what makes you want to get up in the morning. You, great example, we used to do, we used to interview a lot of Ivy Leagues and Berkeleys and Stanford's at, at the investment bank. Most of the guys that will, it, w- would do the interviews would talk about mod, you know, financial modeling and EBITDA and NOI and revenue base. And, and I would go, I'd throw them for a loop. I'd say, the very fact that you're sitting across from me, you're probably a hell of a lot smarter than I am. So let's not even talk about that. You know, what kind of music do you like? What's the last great place you visited with your folks or by yourself? Or did you do a bicycle trip? Or, or you know, did you go and see the Rolling Stones? And how was it? You know, we talk about, or, or you know, which teams do you, do, uh, do you follow the A's? Do you follow the Giants, the Niners, uh, or Yankees, or Red Sox? And so we, I would talk about different things because you learn more about somebody when you talk about things that are not the reason that they are sitting across the desk from you. It's good to hear that because I, I don't know if you feel this way, but I feel somewhat in um, a culture where we've moved to more and more virtual meetings. It feels like a lot of this has been abstracted and it's very transactional, Yeah, a lot of these interactions. And um, what's cool about hearing your life story, homie, and how you interact with people it seems you think very holistically, like whether it's these meetings you're talking about of interviewing someone or with friends or somebody you meet at a bus stop. It feels um, the way you think about the world, the way you think about relationships is holistic. It's about business, but it's about your personal life. And I don't know if you would agree that's a fair assessment. Do you feel anything that you've observed or learned in the business world of hospitality has affected you on a personal level and how you show up for friends or family? I, I, t- totally. Yeah. And and I guess the... Uh, you know, as as you get older and you think more and more holistically, or you look at the world from again from fifty thousand feet. I'm also a lazy bastard. So what happens is, if somebody gives me a forty page deck, you lost me. You know, but if somebody summarizes that in four to six pages. You got me. Uh, So I'm a big picture guy. Hmm. My reputation, even in the investment banking world, was he's great at relationships. He's great getting work. He's great at negotiating. He's lousy at execution. (laughs) And you know what? Guilty as charged. I, I want to, um, it's interesting you say that, but I, I, I don't know. If I look at your track record, I, I might dispute that point. But you say you're a big picture guy. I, how can we think bigger in hospitality? Because as you were recounting some stories, people had a fixed mindset. Luxury kind of broke even or lost money or had these very nominal returns. You kind of shattered that. 
you're a big picture guy. How do we, even today, push the boundaries of what's possible in hospitality and think bigger? You, you have to constantly reinvent yourself. L let's take Abangiri, for example, right? Um, there was so much criticism against me, so primarily, um, for trying to build this crazy resort in the middle of nowhere. Um, and we did build it. We became very successful. Uh, it became the number one resort in the United States. And, and pretty soon, it, the financial results for, for Amangiri and for others as well, but for Amangiri specifically, was it had the highest NOI per key of any resort in the U.S. and possibly in the world. Okay, so then now what? You know, where, do you, where do you go from here? Um, so then what we did was we said, okay, let, let's, there is this concept of experiential luxury, holistic, light on earth, experiential luxury that has been very prevalent in Africa and in Asia, but it, it's in its infancy in the United States. So again, you know, there are lots of little, lots of companies and some big companies that have done experiential resorts. But they were the $250 to $300 ADR resorts, floppy tents. And we started experimenting with bricks and mortar tents. And I talked to, a, you know, I talked to a lot of people around the world that had done this. And we built 10 tents, one bedrooms and two bedrooms at near Amangiri uh, called Camp Sarika with its own infrastructure, its you know, own lobby and own you know, public areas. And we opened during the pandemic, in the pandemic. We were running practically 100% occupancy at well north of $5,000 ADR. So we reinvented ourselves. Now, we had a great bricks and mortar resort. We had a great adjunct tented camp. So that, what's next? So the next step would, would be build residences. So that's what I resigned as a CEO of the company, but, but there are other guys that are now doing the residences, you know? And so hopefully in the next five years, they'll have residences. Then what happens? Then you've got to start brainstorming. Uh, do we do, uh, do we do an artist colony? Um, and do we do a speakeasy? You know, what do you, what's, what's the next? But what I have done is, as my last hurrah, we've started a company, mostly with the Canyon folks, but we'll, we are going out now to the market to raise more capital to do these light on earth, standalone tented camps. So they'll be, you know, they'll be branded six senses. They'll be, and there'll be 40 tents with the public area. But again, at a very high price point, nobody's doing that. What do you have to push through to reinvent yourself? Because it sounds good, but I imagine there's some psychology or there could be a mental barrier to be, I'm known for this. It's a big risk to go into uncharted territory. Do you feel that? Is there something you need to push through to reinvent yourself? Uh, uh, all the time. You have to have doubts. If you don't have doubts, you're cocky. If you're cocky, that's a recipe for disaster. But, but you know, you have to always have doubts. Um, it, it keeps you honest, in a way. You know, uh, it just, it, you know, it's one thing for you to say how, 
if you're good or not, but it's a whole different thing for others to say that you're good. So that's that's validation. I love that. Um, I think before we go, I, I would love to hear what you're most excited about looking forward. I think you may have just touched on this. Yes. Is that is that kind of what right. it gets you most excited these days? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So we're now we're we're um, we are going about looking at we're about to acquire land in the Canyon country where we are going to have our very first uh, prototype. Yeah, it's going to be, it's not necessarily a proof of concept because we've already done that with the Cap Sharika. Uh, so this is going to be, we're going to call it Can Corongo by Six Senses. And Six Senses is, this brand is just very, very powerful because it's a wellness brand. Um, and it's owned by IG. And so that's, that's going to be the first one. And then we are looking at other, you know, we are looking at Yosemite. Uh, we're looking at Wyoming. We're looking at several places. But it's my last hurrah. What I'm going to do is build a small company again, but then back off and let them do everything. Let the folks that work with me um, as partners uh, take it to the finish line. But yep, that's that's my last hurrah. 